right, maybe we'll go ahead and get started. Good morning, good frigid, cold morning. Thank you for joining us for Windship Grand Rounds this morning, uh, either in person or online. Uh, a few reminders, <laughs> if you are an Emory University or healthcare employee and would like to receive CME credit for attending today, the access code today is 772759 and can be found in the chat feature at the bottom of your screen for our virtual attendees. If you have any issues with this webinar or the CME login, please send Kadiatu Fafana an email or drop a note via the chat feature. This morning, uh, we are pleased to welcome Dr. Jane Mizell. Uh, Dr. Mizell graduated magna cum laude from Harvard College in 2004 with a degree in the history of science and earned her medical degree in 2008 from Harvard Medical School. She completed her residency in internal medicine at the Brigham uh, in 2011. During that time, she conducted research in breast cancer at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. She completed her fellowship in medical oncology at Morris Sloan Kettering in New York and served as a chief fellow there before joining us at Emory. And she's currently an associate professor in the Department of Hematology Medical Oncology uh, and is joined the Glenn Family Breast Center since 2015. It's really great to have uh, Dr. Maisel speak with us this morning. Uh, and her talk will be optimizing treatment for early stage triple negative breast cancer. I'll pass it on to, to Dr. Maisel. Awesome. Thanks so much. And thanks so much to those of you who braved the cold and got out here this morning. And even for those of you online who got up this morning, um, really glad to have you all here and looking forward to talking with you about this topic today. Here are my disclosures. And so a little bit of background about triple negative breast cancer. So triple negative breast cancer accounts for about 20% of breast cancers worldwide. It's more commonly diagnosed in women under the age of 40 and disproportionately affects black women and carriers of BRCA genetic mutations. It typically presents aggressively and has a poorer prognosis compared to other subtypes. If you have stage four triple negative breast cancer, the five-year overall survival is really still pretty dismal, around 12%. So we need to do better. And we've had a number of new drugs approved in the metastatic setting in recent years, which has been very exciting, but these drugs move the needle only incrementally. We get three more months here, four more months there, but they're very far from a cure. And so we really need to do more work in the areas of prevention, early detection, optimizing curative regimens, and then for those who are lucky enough to beat this disease, survivorship. So that's where we'll focus our talk today. A little bit of a background on kind of what we'll discuss. I thought we'd start with prevention and early detection. I'm going to tell you a little bit about some of the work we're doing here at Emory, um, revolving around genetic testing and the story of J-Screen, so I'll tell you. Then we'll spend a good chunk of time talking about optimizing treatment outcomes. We'll talk about some advances in neoadjuvant chemotherapy um, and also some things coming down the pipeline. We'll talk about how to personalize adjuvant therapy after patients have either achieved a complete response to neoadjuvant chemo or not. And then we'll talk about approaches to patients with very small tumors. Are there folks in whom we can pull back and potentially do less? We'll talk a little bit then about some biomarker research, uh, some work in novel RNA sequencing and tumor infiltrating lymphocytes, much of which is being done here. Um, and then just a minute about survivorship, since I think that's really such an important topic all around. So starting with prevention, a little bit of background on that. I think the philosophy there is that in order to optimize prevention, it's important to identify who's at high risk. We know that African-American women have a higher risk of triple negative breast cancer compared to white women. And we know that up to 20% with triple negative breast cancer will harbor a mutation in a breast cancer susceptibility gene, particularly in BRCA1. Um, those of you who have studied this may know that BRCA1 mutations are actually more commonly seen in triple negative breast cancer patients than BRCA2. So we do have the ability to get a little bit specific there. And specifically with BRCA, if a patient knows they have a mutation, there are things that they can change about the way they approach their health care. They can opt for mammograms alternating with MRIs for breast cancer screening every six months. And this can often allow for early detection of suspicious lesions. They can consider risk-reducing bilateral mastectomies since the risk of getting breast cancer by the age of 70 is so high in these patients. It's actually one of the options once patients are sort of ready and willing to consider this. And then if they're diagnosed with breast cancer and they know that they have a BRCA mutation, they can actually be a candidate now for different therapies. There was a study looking at adjuvant olaparib, which is a PARP inhibitor, in patients who are BRCA mutation carriers with high-risk disease. And this study showed that getting an oral PARP inhibitor for one year can actually improve the likelihood of cure. So knowing your mutation status can help you understand better how to screen for cancer, what you can do from a risk reduction standpoint, and then also can impact treatment. So important to know about. So as Dr. Klinsky mentioned, I was a history of science major, and I always love thinking about the history of drug development, the history of testing, how these things evolve. Um, so a little bit of background about genetic testing. In 1996, 
um, BRCA1 and 2 mutational testing became the first genetic test available for cancer risk. BRCA1 was known at that time to be present in about 1% of the general Jewish population. And at that time when testing first came out, it was limited largely to Ashkenazi Jews with strong family histories of breast cancer. Now, testing has evolved by leaps and bounds, and I'll describe some of that. It's much more accessible and comprehensive. And so the question came up of, you know, might it be useful to expand this testing to include more of the potentially at risk population? And in testing more patients, we learned more about who all might really be at high risk for these mutations. So JScreen is a group um, that was launched here in 2010 through Emory's Department of Genetics. JScreen was first launched as a reproductive carrier screening program. So for patients or, or individuals who might be getting married and thinking about having children, um, screening them for recessive mutations that if both, patient, both parents were carriers, could combine to produce something potentially lethal in a child like Tay-Sachs or things like this. Um, and this was very successful and many, many people I know completed this screening. And in 2019, folks from JScreen approached me to ask, could this platform for testing be potentially useful for patients at risk for cancer? Um, would there be interest in this among patients um, you know, to do this kind of screening program? Um, and is this something we could look at? So we thought a bit about how to do this and what might be the best way. And we thought it might be good to do this in the form of a research study. Um, enrolling patients, giving them essentially free genetic testing, and then understanding a little bit about how they like this model of, of testing and counseling um, for cancer-related genetics. So the program, you know, every program has got to have a name. We called it the Peach BRCA study, Peach because of the Georgia peach. It was done here in Georgia. Uh, it was a program for evaluation of Ashkenazi cancer heritability. And this was launched in July 2019, just about six months or nine months before COVID hit. And the goal here was to learn more about the appetite for genetic testing in the community, the likelihood of positive test results and the acceptability of virtual genetic counseling. And it was interesting because this was launched, as I said, before COVID. Um, but even then, there was this concept of, you know, we want to be doing genetic testing for more patients, but there's limits in how many genetic counselors are actually available to provide the counseling and testing done. Um, and in this program, we were doing the model a little bit differently. Um, I'll explain how the counseling works. So eligibility included, you had to have at least one Ashkenazi Jewish grandparent. Uh, the patients who enrolled had to be at least age 25 or over. They had to be Metro Atlanta residents um, with no prior BRCA testing and no significant personal or close family history of BRCA-related cancers. This was essentially a platform for folks who would not have qualified at that time to receive testing through their insurance company, but were interested in getting genetic testing and understanding their cancer mm -hmm. risk. Um, and so the way this was done is patients had a video that they watched prior to producing a saliva sample. Um, they took a pretest questionnaire to understand how well they knew what they were getting into. And then the results were given via either phone or video conference from a certified genetic counselor. And that phone and video conferencing idea was actually something that was part built into this protocol even from the beginning before COVID, but became very useful once COVID was you know, here and we needed to move a lot of things virtually anyway. So 501 patients enrolled and they did so pretty quickly. It was actually very interesting. When we first launched this, we ended up going around to a lot of Jewish community centers, um, talking to synagogues, tried to increase awareness in the community that this program was out there to see, you know, do average risk patients with some Ashkenazi Jewish heritage want this? Um, it turned out that people did. Um, the positivity rate, we had four patients test positive, so slightly lower than what has been reported in the average Ashkenazi population. Remember, we were selecting for people who did not have a family history or personal history of cancer. Um, and these patients were tested. Um, in many cases, these patients were tested, received positive results, and then told their family members. And then it came out that actually, oh, this person did have breast cancer. Um, and others got tested in families and found that they had mutations as well. So it was found to be very useful for these folks. And what we found in terms of how patients liked it was that the overall satisfaction with the study process was pretty high. Patients liked the pretest video and written summary as a means of, you know, understanding what they were getting themselves into with genetic testing. Um, and then they, the vast, vast majority, as you can see, felt that the post-testing genetic counseling session was valuable. Um, many patients after they did this testing, because this was only BRCA1 and BRCA2 gene sequencing, not um, more of a broader platform, um, they did express interest in receiving broader cancer testing. Um, and for some of these patients, as we talked to them afterwards, it was actually harder to get that testing, either because they didn't qualify for it through insurance, um, because it was hard to you know, arrange their busy lives to get back to the genetic counselor and order broader testing or those kinds of things. It seemed that the interest and appetite for it was there. So the conclusions we came to were that the pretest video and written summary is a pretty effective and satisfactory model of pretest education for many people, and the telehealth model for post-test genetic counseling is acceptable. And the implications for that were that genetic counseling and testing via telehealth could actually be a great opportunity, COVID or no COVID, for people who might have trouble accessing in-person genetic counseling and subsequent testing after that. You know, especially in populations where you sort of you want to find the patients who are positive, but it may be a small number. It may be reasonable not to counsel everybody extensively pretest. 
but to do more intensive counseling post-test for those who find that they are mutation carriers. And I would say, you know, just in terms of what some of these implications are, it is very impressive that these patients who tested positive, tested positive, and then sort of came to us having found this through this platform, um, and it did impact their lives pretty significantly in terms of what they decided to do later for prevention, and I'll give a few examples of that. So this is a great study. We were excited about it, but we were wondering, you know, what are the next steps that we can take? Um, and around the same time, there, was study, there were studies coming out showing that BRCA was really not just a Jewish problem as it had originally been envisioned, but actually it was a problem in other populations around the globe. There were studies that came out in the mid-20-teens showing reports of BRCA mutations in 12 to 18 percent of Af African-American breast cancer patients. One study showing that Hispanic patients in the southwestern U.S. with a personal or family history of breast cancer, their mutation rates can be as high as 25 percent. And mutation rates that high have also been reported in breast and ovarian cancer patients in India. So maybe BRCA1 and 2 mutation testing shouldn't just be limited or focused on that population. Um, Caitlin Taylor, who was a fellow here several years ago and is now practicing in New Orleans, did a study actually interestingly looking at Emory patients with ovarian cancer. She basically took a large cohort of patients who'd been diagnosed with high-grade serous ovarian cancer. These are patients who, for whom genetic testing is recommended across the board. Um, to understand how many of those patients were actually getting genetic testing, and of those who did test, what was the likelihood of getting an actionable result? And what she found when she did this retrospective study looking back at our population over about a 10-year period was that African-American patients were much less likely to undergo genetic testing, 25% of the African-American patients versus 75% of the Caucasian patients. And this was felt to be due to a number of factors. But when those patients did test, they had higher rates of mutations found, 22% versus 8% for BRCA1 and 11% versus 6% for BRCA2. Um, so really showing that this is something that I think you know, should not just be a Jewish thing, but should be expanded and offered to all populations. So as we thought about this with J-Screen, we thought you know, maybe this could be something bigger, kind of like the reproductive carrier testing, initially targeted at Jewish populations, actually, because of things like TASAC, um, but now really available to anyone who wants to access it. Um, and this information was used to establish a national cancer genetic screening program. Um, we launched this in January 2021, and I've been the medical director to date. Um, it's been a really exciting venture to be a part of, and basically allows people who are interested in genetic testing to log on to JSCREEN's site, order a saliva kit, do a pretest questionnaire, and a, watch a pretest video, and then have their counseling done after the fact. Um, and for patients who can't access this kind of testing otherwise, it's been a really great resource. Um, this is designed for people ages 21 and older, the reason being that there's probably not a lot you would act on before age 21, and you also might not be ready to receive that information. Um, and the, the gene panel is actually fairly comprehensive. So one of the things we learned from Peach Braca is that patients who tested negative, which was the majority, were actually interested in doing testing for other cancer susceptibility genes. So this test is a much more comprehensive test, and people have liked that. Um, so the first three years of this program have been very successful. We've screened over 4,000 patients. Um, the panel at first was 63 genes, now it's 73 genes, and 14% had screened positive for a deleterious mutation. So when you broaden the panel out you know, to 63 or 73 genes as opposed to two, um, you do pick up more stuff. Um, who's using this service is another thing that's, of course, of interest. 72% are female, 67% report some Jewish ancestry, and 67% are between the ages of 22 and 49. So this is a, a younger population and people who probably do have ways to act on this information in terms of prevention and potentially treatment. 17% um, of the patients are from Georgia, which is expected because that's where we are, um, but they have come from all 60 states. And we've helped connect people who test positive for mutations um, to healthcare providers in their local communities so that they can get the care that they need. And what are the benefits? People often ask this question, you know, should I get genetic testing? Is genetic testing for me? And I usually answer that knowledge is power. If you know your cancer risk, you can take steps to prevent it or catch it in an early stage and ultimately have better quality of life and potentially longer of life. Um, and before I leave, leave you um, on this topic and move on to talking about cancer treatment, I'll just leave you with one real example. This is a patient who was in her early studies when she found out about her BRCA mutation, did not have cancer, had also not been screened. She chose to do uh, mammograms alternating with breast MRIs for breast cancer screening. She wasn't quite ready to have a prophylactic surgery. Um, but in the meantime, wasn't married yet, knew she wanted kids, and decided to harvest her eggs in case something happened and she didn't have the opportunity to conceive naturally later on. Three years later, she had her you know, mammogram. She'd had an MRI six months before it had been normal. Um, and the mammogram showed something. She ended up having a triple negative breast cancer, unfortunately, but it was an eight millimeter triple negative breast cancer. So she had bilateral mastectomies and was able to get much less chemotherapy than she would have had to have if she had potentially not screened until she was safe and had found cancer as it had grown you know, much larger in size. And the nice thing was also she'd had time to sort of digest the mutation information before she got cancer. 
um, had time to think about what she wanted from a fertility standpoint. So although the cancer diagnosis was still you know, devastating no matter what, it was sort of a win genetic testing and for allowing her to get away with less treatment. Um, so that's sort of the prevention and genetic story. And of course, I'm happy to take any questions about that program or about that philosophy when we're done. We we'll move on to talk about treatment outcomes. Um, so treatment of triple negative breast cancer is a tricky thing. The background and backbone of systemic therapy for triple negative breast cancer for a long time has been dose-dense ACT. You hear those acronyms thrown around all the time. Um, many of you have probably prescribed that or given it. Um, it's a more effective regimen than just AC alone or TC alone for what came before that. But mutations still occur despite receiving ACT. And adriamycin, which is the A in that regimen, carries longer-term risks like cardiomyopathy and leukemia that make it kind of an undesirable regimen to give unless absolutely necessary. So there's sort of a desire to be able to do more, cure more patients, but also the desire to do less and maybe move away from cycling just as it can be such a hard regimen to tolerate. So how do we improve from here? I think the question of, you know, how do we do this research? How do we conduct studies that lead us to new regimens um, is always a good one. And the widespread uptake of new adjuvant therapy in the 20 teens made much more elegant research possible. So why is this? What we found and learned is that with neoadjuvant chemotherapy, if you get to a pathologic complete response, meaning you get chemotherapy prior to surgery, and then at the time of surgery, the surgical specimen has no cancer cells left, that's called a PCR, a pathologic complete response. As you can see from the blue line there, if you get to PCR with triple negative breast cancer, your relapse-free survival, even out to eight years, is pretty minimal. Like you, your cure is quite high. But if you have a residual cancer burden, which you can see in yellow and gray and in red, um, the more significant your residual cancer burden, the higher your risk of recurrence. But if you have a lot of disease left at the time of surgery, despite receiving new adjuvant therapy, your risk of recurrence and then death from triple negative breast cancer can be quite high. So the interesting thing about that is that PCR can be used to help predict prognosis. And we often tell patients who ask at diagnosis, you know, what is my prognosis like from this? Um, that we'll know a whole lot more by the time we get to surgery and see how they respond to treatment. And the piece of this is interesting is that PCR can be used as a robust endpoint in trials of novel new adjuvant therapies. Because if you can do something different up front and get more patients with PCR, you can pretty easily extrapolate from that that these patients are likely to do better overall, and the studies do bear that out. So then the question became, you know, we've got the backbone of ACT, what can we add to that, or how can we choose that to get higher rates of PCR and cure more women of this disease? So checkpoint inhibitors, as many of you know, have been a big step forward in this area. And there are several reasons why checkpoint inhibitors are an exciting option for triple negative breast cancer. Triple negative breast cancers tend to have higher mutation than HER2 positive or HER2 or uh, hormone positive tumors. And this can lead to a higher frequency of immunogenification and can be a marker of improved survival following immunotherapy across multiple tumor types. Um, so we know that this potentially portends good responses to immunotherapy. Triple negative breast cancers have higher mean quantities of TIL, tumor infiltrating lymphocytes, relative to other breast cancer subtypes. And in early triple negative breast cancer, higher TIL count can correlate with improved survival, reduced recurrence risk, and better responses to neoadjuvant chemo. And I'll show some of that data later on. Finally, triple negative breast cancers also have higher rates of PL expression relative to other breast cancer subtypes. So even before immunotherapy was on the horizon for triple negative breast cancer uh, in the real world, there was a study done here by Bill Lee and other colleagues in 2016 showing that stromal PDL1 expression correlates with better disease-free survival in triple negative breast cancer. Um, this study and others, you know, this idea has been on the horizon for years. And so when immunotherapy came to the forefront, this became a potential target for CDC. So a great place to study this or start studying this was iSpy2. This is a study we have open at Emory. Dr. Klinsky is the PI here. Um, and this is a study looking at how do we optimize neoadjuvant chemotherapy. The idea is we've got this backbone again, ACT, at least at the time of this uh, particular point in the study. And the idea was you could take novel therapies, add that to the paclitaxel portion of the study, um, and see if patients who got the novel therapy in addition to the chemotherapy backbone better. Um, so in this particular part that I'll talk about, patients, some received standard paclitaxel for 12 weeks followed AC, and then other patients received paclitaxel plus pembrolizumab or Keytruda followed by AC for the first four cycles. So pretty simple model, just the idea that you were adding four cycles of pembrolizumab um, to the standard backbone, and then looking at do patients have higher PCR rates when you add immunotherapy or not. And I spy studied not just pembrolizumab, but studies all sorts of different novel combinations. And the idea is that if novel combinations do well in that upfront setting and get more patients to PCR, mm -hmm. then those novel drugs and drug combinations can graduate and be studied at higher levels. So pembrolizumab ended up being very successful in iSpy. Patients on this arm of the study who received pembrolizumab plus AC and paclitaxel had much higher PCR rates in triple negative breast cancer, 60% versus 
um, which is a pretty significant increase. Um, it was very exciting data when uh, Dr. Nanda presented this at one of our big meetings back in, I think, 2019. Um, and that led to Keynote 522, which many of you probably know of, a um, big pivotal study that has changed the standard of care. But this study looked at a much more complex regimen than just Pembro plus Paxil followed by AC. What this study did was it randomized patients in a two-to-one fashion to receive IVO, either carbo, carboplatin and paclitaxel for 12 weeks, followed by an anthracycline and cyclophosphamide for 12 weeks, plus placebo, or receiving that same 12-week 12, uh, 12 and 12-week, or you should say 24-week combination with pembrolizumab every three weeks all the way through. Patients then went to surgery, and then afterwards, the patients who received placebo before received placebo after, and the patients who received pembrolizumab before received pembrolizumab 200 milligrams every three weeks for 27 weeks. So a bit more of a complex regimen, um, but a very pivotal study. So what this study showed is that PCR rates, again, that pathologic complete response, were improved significantly with the addition of pembrolizumab, went from 51% to 65%. And sure enough, that correlated with improvements in event-free survival. At three years, 77% of the patients who received chemo alone were alive without recurrence, versus 85% of the ones who received pembrolizumab. And so with that, this became a new standard of care for high-risk triple negative breast cancer. And this is really what we've been sort of relying on in these patients for the past several years. There's some challenges with this combination, though. And I think we often see this, that when you study drugs in a clinical trial setting, you know, even in the clinical trial, patients have side effects, but it's often even more pronounced in the real world, where patients may not be as well supported, um, as healthy outside of their breast cancer, and all those kinds of things. Um, and side effects with this treatment can be quite challenging. There was one real world study presented, I can't remember if it was ASCO or San Antonio this year, but that I thought was very instrumental looking at keynote versus just chemo and side effects in the real world population. And you can see that with the immunotherapy-based regimen, patients do have more treatment interruptions, um, more changes in treatment due to side effects, and significantly more cytopenias, fatigue, neuropathy, and other things. So while this regimen has been amazing and has been curative for many patients, um, it's also hard. And getting that adjuvant pembrolizumab for a number of weeks afterwards, 27 weeks, can also be challenging logistically as well as physically. Um, what we find is that, you know, because these patients are often younger, they also often have more life responsibilities. And so even just getting here for the pembrolizumab for those additional treatments um, can be challenging in terms of work responsibilities, childcare, and all the rest, and it can be a lot. So, you know, does every patient need this whole full regimen, um, or are there some alternatives? And there are some alternatives under investigation, and I think the key here is that it's not a one-size-fits-all approach, that immunotherapy definitely helps chemotherapy, but not everyone needs all the treatment. So this is a really interesting and I think very informative study um, done out of uh, the University of Kansas and presented by Priyanka Sharma a year or two ago at ASCO 2022, looking at a slightly different combination, so a bit simpler. These patients were triple negative breast cancer patients receiving neoadjuvant chemo, and it was a single arm study. So everyone who enrolled received carboplatin, docetaxel, and pembrolizumab for 18 weeks, six cycles prior to surgery. Then they went to surgery. And then follow-up and adjuvant therapy was at the provider's discretion. So there was no adjuvant pembro uh, required per protocol. These patients, uh, there were 115 patients who were enrolled over that three and a half year period of time. You can see the age of diagnosis at median was about 50. Um, the majority of patients were white, but there were almost 20% black patients in this trial. Um, about 10% had a germline BRCA mutation. Um, and then these patients uh, had a number of different qualities that were looked at in terms of their surgery type, whether or not they received radiation. And then about 5% of them received adjuvant immunotherapy, but definitely not the vast majority on this study. And then this is the rates of pathologic complete response in dark purple, and then RCB0 plus one. So those patients who have just a tiny amount of residual cancer um, were also something felt to be worthy of investigation here. And you can see that for all comers, 58% got to PCR with this regimen, which is still a pretty good number. Um, and if you include those patients who had just a tiny amount of residual disease, that number went up to 69%. Um, not surprisingly, no negative patients did better than no positive patients, but all saw benefit from immunotherapy, we think. Um, and patients who were PDL1 positive tended to do better than PDL1 negative. Um, and then event-free survival, if you look at that, you can see that at two years, the patients who got to PCR had a 98% chance of still remaining disease-free at that time. All comers had an 89% chance, but those who had residual disease had a much higher risk of recurrence. 78% only were event-free at two years meaning that 22% of those patients had already recurred at that two-year time point. Um, so again, showing that PCR makes a difference, um, and also showing that adding immunotherapy to a slightly less intense chemotherapy backbone could potentially be effective. So is this ready for prime time? It was a small study. It was a single arm, but I think definitely an important contribution to the literature. Um, just a couple of examples from my clinic with a few features changed just to protect confidentiality. A 62-year-old woman with a history of cardiac stent placement, type 2 diabetes, hyperlipidemia, 
and a 2.6 centimeter triple negative breast cancer with one positive node. This is someone who, for whom avoiding an anthracycline was desirable um, and where she didn't have such bulky and extensive disease that I felt she could get away with something like this. Another real world example, a 55 year old woman who'd actually had a triple negative breast cancer on one side 15 years ago when she was 40, received dose dose ACT. And then last year we developed a breast cancer on the other side that was also triple negative, was node negative, but was 3.2 centimeters. And these are both patients to whom I gave the Neopact regimen. Talk to them about the limitations, the small amount of data, um, but use shared decision-making to make this decision with them. So what's in the pipeline? Are there other interesting things coming along? So datapotamab deruxtecan is another drug that I'm pretty excited about. Um, this is a trope 2 directed antibody drug conjugate. The way that works, um, kind of like sasituzumab govotecan, which many of you may be familiar with, is that it binds to trope 2, internalizes into the cancer cell, and then releases its chemotherapy payload into the cell. The chemotherapy payload can then kill off that cancer cell and also penetrate into neighboring cancer cells um, to lead to tumor regression. And this has been studied in later line metastatic triple negative breast cancer in the Tropion Can Tumor 01 study. You can see in these two waterfall plots that this drug performs very, very well, even in heavily pretreated patients, and even in patients who had received a prior topoisomerase inhibitor based antibody drug conjugate. So, pretty exciting. Um, and things that get, get studied in later line settings then often get studied earlier on. Um, and these are some results from the frontline metastatic begonia study looking at data potamab plus durvalumab, so immunotherapy plus an ADC and first line metastatic triple negative breast cancer, showing a 79% response rate, median progression free survival of almost 14 months. Um, so again, pretty exciting data. Um, and again, if you look at the history of drug development, a lot of things that get studied in metastatic disease and are successful then get studied earlier on. So we've got a few studies ongoing around the world um, and, and also here at Emory looking at this drug. Um, actually an arm of iSpy2 looking at this. It's been very exciting to watch. Um, looking at data potamab plus or minus dervalumab for four cycles. And these patients who enroll in iSpy2, again, that same study where pembrolizumab was first studied, they first get this novel combination. Then if they have a great response on imaging, can actually go straight to surgery after that. Um, if they don't go, get a great response on imaging, then they go on to receive carboplatin, paclitaxel, pembrolizumab. If they don't get a great response to that, can then also receive AC. Um, so this is an exciting arm of iSpy2, and we all look forward to those results. And then Tropion Breast 04 and Tropion Breast 02 are two other really exciting studies looking at neoadjuvant data potamab plus or minus dervalumab in different settings. Um, so it'll be exciting to see what happens with this drug and whether it becomes a part of our standard of care for some patients at some point. Um, and so then personalizing adjuvant therapy becomes sort of another question after you talk about what to do neoadjuvantly. What do you do for patients who get to PCR? Is there an opportunity to maybe do less and pull back afterwards? Um, if patients who don't get to PCR, who we know from all of these studies are high risk, um, is there more that we should be doing? So those are the questions. Do patients who achieve PCR need additional immunotherapy? We know that those patients do pretty well. So do they still need those 27 weeks of Pembro that they got on Keynote 522 um, or their patients who can get away with less? And then for those who don't get to PCR, what's the best approach? So optimized PCR is a study that's open here at Emory that is actually very exciting. And I think um, seeing the results of this will be interesting. Um, I'm the ECOG sponsor for this trial, and it's being conducted throughout cooperative groups around the country. And it's a pretty simple design. So basically, patients who have stage 2 to 3 triple negative breast cancer get a PCR to neoadjuvant chemo and immunotherapy, get randomized to receive pembrolizumab for 27 weeks or to be observed. And patients are stratified based on their nodal status at baseline and whether or not they received anthracycline. But the goal of this study is to evaluate whether, whether observation after PCR results in a non-inferior recurrence-free survival compared to adjuvant pembrolizumab. And if observation does result in a non-inferior recurrence free survival for these patients, you could postulate that potentially we could spare these patients that adjuvant pembro. So it's an exciting concept and we look forward to seeing how patients respond to this. Um, there are a bunch of secondary objectives as well. You know, of course, looking at adverse events, looking at quality of life, there'll be a number of questionnaires that patients fill out over the course of the study and then overall survival, as well as a number of correlatives such as pdl one pills, circulating tumor DNA, are there ways we can look at to see um, if patients are higher risk or lower risk that the study can shed light on? So that's the good risk patients. What about patients who are higher risk who don't achieve PCR? This is a slide actually from uh, Keynote 522 from one of the plenaries in 2021 where this data was first presented. And you can see circled in red there that patients who get to PCR or who, patients who don't get to PCR tend to do better if they receive pembrolizumab. But even if they receive pembrolizumab, a third of them are recurring by 36 months. So we still need to do more and do better for these patients. Like getting that adjuvant pembro for these folks is probably actually not enough. Um, so what are the options for these patients? You can add CAPE cytobine. Um, Create X was a study that was done a long time ago, published back in 2017, showing that for patients who don't get to PCR with new adjuvant chemotherapy, 
you can actually add 24 weeks of adjuvant oral Zolota or cytobine afterwards um, and get these patients to better outcomes and, and better disease-free survival. If they're BRCA positive, as I mentioned before, you can add a year of olaparib. And there are various ways to do this. I think you know, in clinical practice, a lot of times what we do is for patients who need adjuvant radiation, we keep the pembrolizumab going, let them get through radiation, um, and then start them on the adjuvant capecitabine or olaparib, kind of in combination with the end of pembro, um, and then continue it out uh, for that additional year. Um, but there have no, been no real strong studies looking at how to do this. This is just kind of what's done in clinical practice. Um, and then there's the option to enroll in clinical trials. Um, so antibody drug conjugates are a big part of what's ha happening in the clinical trial space here. There's a trial called Ascent 05 that's looking at adding sastatuzumab govotecan, another trope 2 antibody drug conjugate to pembrolizumab and seeing whether that's better than standard of care. And then tropion breast dose 3 is looking at adding datapodumab, that other agent I was talking about before, plus or minus dervalumab as the adjuvant option, and looking at that plus the standard of care, pembro plus or minus cape cytobine. Um, and there's a star by that one, because we've got that open here at Emory. Um, and then also a vaccine trial that's about to open here, uh, run by my colleague, Dr. Gogadini, that I wanted to highlight. So vaccine therapy is one of those exciting things that has not yet panned out in breast cancer, but we all really badly want it to. Um, and this is an exciting clinical trial looking at a personalized vaccine for patients with triple negative breast cancer who have not achieved PCR. So patients who are high risk, of course, by definition, and then seeing if you create a vaccine for them based on their residual disease specimens. And I'll have All right. Um, so as I was saying, with stage one patients, this is also an important population to be studying, but there are very few clinical trials that actually include these folks. Um, so we don't know as much about what to do for them. So choosing a chemotherapy regimen for a stage one patient is sometimes challenging. There's a trial called the ABC trial, actually published quite some time ago, 2016, but that I still think is very relevant to modern United States clinical practice. This is a trial that looked at ACT versus TC, so anthracycline-based versus non-anthracycline-based, um, looked at outcomes in both hormone positive as well as triple negative breast cancer. And you can see here that the four-year invasive disease-free survival rates uh, broken up by uh, hormone receptor positive and hormone receptor negative, and also by nodal status, show that if you have no negative triple negative breast cancer, there's only about a two and a half percent invasive disease-free survival benefit at four years by adding the anthracycline. Um, certainly that benefit is much greater when you get to even one positive node with about a 10% benefit. But for patients with no negative triple negative breast cancer, it's reasonable to withhold AC in certain cases. 
using shared decision making about what that 2.5% benefit means to folks. But are there people for whom we can actually do less altogether? That's a really interesting question. You know, there are often patients who come in with a seven millimeter triple negative breast cancer, having had a big surgery, that say, I don't understand why I need chemotherapy. Like, why are we doing this? Um, so this is a really interesting study that was done by Paolo Tarantino and other colleagues at Dana-Farber, looking at a SPEAR database of patients with stage one triple negative breast cancer, many of whom received chemo, but some of whom did not receive chemo, and comparing outcomes based on tumor size. And you can see that for patients who had T1C tumors, um, so between one and two centimeters, there was a 3.3% benefit to receiving chemotherapy. Um, that's still a population for whom we absolutely think it's warranted. But interestingly, in patients with T1B tumors, um, so 0.5 to one centimeter, there was only a 0.8% difference in patients in terms of five-year breast cancer-specific survival. So 95.8% versus 96.6%, both groups obviously did quite well. And of course, there are study you know, limitations inherent to this kind of study. It's retrospective. Um, we don't know everything about this patient, these patients because it was a database review. Um, but I think this data is informative, and particularly in older patients who might be frailer um, or just really not want chemotherapy. This gives us some sense of peace if someone like that were to refuse chemo altogether. So a clinical example, I had a patient in my clinic who enrolled in a study looking at neoadjuvant pembro plus intraoperative radiation for stage one triple negative breast cancer. This is a really interesting study and one that's still open here uh, and also at Columbia looking at patients receiving two doses of pembrolizumab, just pembro alone, three weeks apart. They then go to surgery after that. Um, they receive intraoperative radiation during surgery. The goal is to assess actually for changes in pills from the initial biopsy to the time of surgery to see what is the impact of neoadjuvant immunotherapy there. This patient was very interested in science, enrolled in this study, got her immunotherapy and had her surgery. And at surgery, her tumor was less than a centimeter. She had a negative node, clear margin. Um, when she came back for her post-op visit to talk potentially about starting TC, she said she really didn't want additional chemo. She was in her 70s. She had lots she wanted to do. Um, she was pretty happy with her path report, which I think showed a seven millimeter tumor. Um, and she really didn't want the chemo unless I was going to force her hand. So we talked about this. She was in agreement with adjuvant radiation, which the uh, radiation oncology team did feel she needed. Um, but you shared decision making, and I did talk to her about this data, um, opting for observation. So we'll see how that goes. But I think it is a conversation that's worth uh, potentially bringing up and doing more work on in the future. So currently, most patients with tumors greater than five millimeters are still recommended to receive adjuvant chemotherapy. We make exceptions, like I did there, for those who are older who have very strong personal preferences and very small tumors. And patients with tumors less than a centimeter can likely receive non anthracycline based chemotherapy, like four cycles of taxotere and cyclophosphamide. We still need to learn more, though, about who might benefit from immunotherapy, even those with small tumors. And trials like that neoadjuvant Pembro study in stage one disease, particularly, will help with that as will some of the biomarker studies that I'll detail in the next section. So biomarker research is really important. I think uh, one of the things that's most important about that is we've got to know who's more likely to respond to immunotherapy, both so we can make sure that patients who are going to respond to it receive it, and so we know that if people are going to have exquisite responses to it, potentially we can have opportunities to de-escalate their chemotherapy and sort of personalize their regimen a little bit more. Um, so this is an interesting collaboration between Georgia Tech and Emory that I'll detail, um, just because I think it's useful and potentially can lead to, to more work. This is a study where we analyzed 25 triple negative breast cancer specimens pre-treatment and then 31 residual disease specimens after chemotherapy. And these are patients who had received dose-dense ACT, not modern regimens with pembrolizumab, using a novel RNA sequencing protocol that Georgia Tech colleagues had come up with um, from some of the formalin fixed paraffin embedded blocks that these patients had already had preserved. The sequencing profile combined tumor subtype and immune profile with a goal of looking for patterns correlating with risk of residual disease after neoadjuvant chemo or alternatively looking for patterns correlating with lack thereof. These results were validated looking at 182 triple negative breast cancer patients from a Vanderbilt cohort, and then also with about 180 cases from the TCGA database. These results we got to present in a poster at ASCO this past year, we found that 21, 68% of the residual disease specimens were luminal androgen receptor subtype and significantly enriched in the M2 macrophage signature. Um, so this is sort of the most prominent pattern that came up in these residual disease specimens. And when we looked at this particular signature in the Vanderbilt cases, it's kind of a confirmatory study, we found that these signatures also correlated with lack of PCR in the Vanderbilt cases. So I thought, you know, maybe we're onto something. We then looked at the TCGA database to see what these subtypes and uh, signatures looked like in those folks, um, and also found that the uh, LAR subtype, the luminal, luminal androgen receptor subtype, and the macrophage signature correlated with poor survival in those TCGA cases. So still, you know, obviously early data, there's not anything actionable we can do with this yet, but it seems that in all three of these groups, the small Emory cohort, the larger Vanderbilt cohort, and the TCGA cohort, 
we're seeing that these two signatures are strongly associated with lack of PCR and worse survival in patients treated with ACT. Now, some of the limitations here, of course, that regimens have changed. Now, most patients are getting neoadjuvant chemoimmunotherapy as opposed to just neoadjuvant chemo. Uh, but it'll be important to, sub to study these tumor subtypes and immune profiles in patients who ha are receiving modern regimens. Because I think if we could better understand from RNA sequencing or tumor genomics, who's likely to respond to standard chemo? We could also better direct patients who are maybe less likely to respond towards clinical trials of novel regimens. You know, if you had a way of saying to a patient newly diagnosed with triple negative breast cancer, you know, now we, we have a signature that we can use to determine whether you're likely to respond to what I have to offer you in the clinic, or maybe you're someone who needs something more, you could sort of encourage that patient more strongly towards a clinical trial. Or if you're not in a place that has that clinical trial, but there is one 30 miles down the road, that patient might be more motivated to go to that other place and get that study. Um, so again, just thinking about more how we can better serve those patients and, and potentially get more of them to cure this way. Tumor infiltrating lymphocytes is another important topic, and I think it's hard to talk about triple negative breast cancer without talking about pills. Pills are immune cells that have been studied in lots of malignancies um, and can be involved in the anti-tumor response and potentially can be a promising biomarker with very great potential. There have been studies shown that patients with early triple negative breast cancer and high pills have higher responses to treatment and improved survival outcomes. One of our current chief fellows, Sarah Wood, conducted a study looking at this in patients who were treated here at Emory with the Keynote 522 regimen. So this regimen, that uh, chemoimmunotherapy regimen I detailed earlier, uh, was approved about two and a half years ago. And what she did this over this past year was took a look at a real-world population here at Emory um, to assess two things. Is in a real-world population, are we seeing the same good outcomes? Um, and also, can we look at those patients uh, with residual disease um, and check out the relationship of pills, both at the residual time point um, and also at the time of diagnosis, to see if pills relate to clinical outcomes with this regimen? And one of the things that's interesting, and we'll talk about this a little bit as we talk about survivorship, is that Black women are very, you know, predominantly those who are diagnosed with triple negative breast cancer, but they're often very much underrepresented in clinical trials. And Keynote 522 had only a 4.5% Black population. So while it's an amazing regimen and we use it in all people, it's important to understand and think about, you know, how this clinical trial data relates to the patients we're seeing in our clinic. Um, the Emory real world population that Sarah studied um, was actually 60% black women. So we had more black women receiving this uh, accommodation than white women in our study. Um, and because of that, we felt like it was even more important to be reporting these results. So what Dr. Wood found is that in the 76 patients treated with Keynote, we had 29 pretreatment biopsy slides available. And then of course, all the residual disease specimens for those who had residual disease. She took a look at the patient characteristics, the disease characteristics, and then our pathology colleagues did pill staining in their lab. Pills were defined as percent lymphocytes in the stroma within the tumor area. And what she found was that the PCR rate was about 48.4%, so slightly lower than what was reported in keynote. And some of that could be that you know, these patients are real-world patients, potentially with more comorbidities, um, and also with a little bit of a higher uh, disease stage, uh, patient for patient compared to keynote. But the TILs were the only factor significantly associated with PCR and univariate analysis. So TILs in those achieving PCR was 28% versus about almost 10% in those with residual disease. When she further stratified TILs by race, as you can see in this little chart here to the right, the percentage was significantly higher among Black patients who achieved PCR versus Black women who had residual disease. So for those women, um, if they had TILs in their pretreatment biopsy specimen, they were much more likely to get to PCR with new adjuvant chemoimmunotherapy than those who did not. And I think, you know, this is obviously a small study, single institution, so a lot still to be done, um, and of course some limitations. Um, but interesting to know that high tills were associated with achievement of PCR in this population, and that among the black populations in our Tampa population in our study, the differences in tills between PCR versus non-PCR was actually statistically significant. And I think if we had had more white patients, because in this study it was more black patients than white patients, if we'd had more white patients, you could see that it possibly could have been statistically significant in that population as well, um, but certainly something to think about going forward as we stratify patients and as we learn more about how to standardize till evaluation in our pathology lab. Because I think one could envision a future where high tills could be used to predict a good response from current regimens or allow de-escalation. So if someone had a high till percentage of their biopsy specimen, you might feel even more comfortable getting away with less chemotherapy along with immunotherapy. Um, or if you had low tills, that could be a signal that, hey, this patient might not do as well even with the modern chemoimmunotherapy regimens we have. And maybe this could be someone we prioritize for a clinical trial of a novel drug like an ADC um, or of agents that could potentially encourage till formation. So some food for thought there. Um, and Dr. Sachs, another one of our colleagues here at Emory, is doing a really interesting investigator-initiated trial where she's looking at evaluating and monitoring immune responses at diagnosis and then ongoing throughout neoadjuvant <clears throat> chemoimmunotherapy. So she's taking patients who are getting the Keynote 522 study outside of a trial, 
Um, let's see, it says the computer's about to restart. What should I do with that? News. Okay. Um, so her primary objective is to look at this, uh, whether the Keynote 522 regimen induces a pro-inflammatory cytokine milieu. And she's taking patients who receive their regimen. She's doing a blood sample the following day, 24 hours later, and then checking blood again periodically throughout treatment. And then at the time of surgery, she'll be assessing whether or not there are specific signatures, kind of like what we talked about earlier, that are associated with PCR for these patients or certain signatures, signatures not associated with PCR. Um, so an exciting pilot study, and we're looking forward to seeing where that goes. Um, and then in terms of survivorship, I think um, I'll obviously stop in a minute to take questions, but it's important to think about this because even though we still have a ways to go in terms of optimizing upfront management of triple negative breast cancer, we do have a growing number of survivors from this disease. And because these patients who survive are often have withstood significant amounts of treatment in terms of chemoimmunotherapy and maybe even novel agents uh, in the curative setting, attention to survivorship issues is badly needed. So neuropathy prevention and treatment is one of those areas that's really important. Neuropathy is a side effect from chemotherapy that can become um, permanent if you don't pay close attention to it. And the fact that we're doing carboplatin plus paclitaxel now in many of our new adjuvant regimens makes these patients at slightly higher risk for neuropathy. Um, so studies of things like uh, cooling of the hands and feet, um, applying pressure to the hands and feet during treatment to reduce blood flow to the extremities, um, those are ongoing. And I think it'll be interesting to learn more about who's at high risk for neuropathy and how do we optimize and prevent that terrible side effect. Then also pembrolizumab and fertility is another thing that's really interesting. Um, a lot of triple negative breast cancer patients are diagnosed with their disease before they have time to complete their families. And while we know a fair amount now about the effect of chemotherapy on future fertility, we don't know a lot about pembrolizumab. Um, so this is something that's being actively studied and with studied in which we're actively partnering with our reproductive endocrinology group here at Emory to try to understand better and think about some of these endpoints, um, how we can look at them in clinical trials, and whether we can study things like resumption of menstrual cycles in the clinical trials that have already been done to try to better understand how pembrolizumab might affect fertility for those patients going forward. And then mental health, I think you know, this is something that's hard to study, but I think important to think about as clinicians and as researchers, um, that this is a very hard diagnosis to get through, and even with cure. Um, there's still a lot of stress that accompanies the diagnosis, the treatment, and the aftermath. Um, we have to work hard to optimize mental health care and support for our patients both during and after cancer treatment. We're fortunate to have a great team here, our social workers, our support group, um, our psychiatry colleagues to help our patients with that the most. Um, but I think something really critical to keep in mind. So some conclusions before I take questions. The management of triple negative breast cancer is changing rapidly, and that's a good thing. Um, with immunotherapy now being a standard of care for locally advanced disease, we have to learn more about its long-term effects and how to better predict its efficacy and tolerability. We need to get a better understanding of where we can pull back and personalize treatment more effectively. And for patients with smaller tumors, that kind of work is particularly needed. And diversity in clinical trials is also really important in triple negative breast cancer and has been a challenge for the field to date. And Emory has and continues to contribute a lot of value to this research via our enrollment in clinical trials and retrospective analyses. Um, it's been great to see so much really interesting independent work come out of our group, especially in the past few years. Um, so thank you to so many people. Um, Dr. Kalinsky, who introduced me today, has been an amazing mentor, colleague, and friend. Um, all of my colleagues here in the Breast Center, uh, my fellow medical oncologists, our two fellows, Dr. Wood and Dr. Taylor, who I've so enjoyed working with and who have produced some really interesting work in this space as well. Um, Dr. Lee and Dr. Douglas, uh, my colleagues here at Emory and Georgia Tech, who have helped a lot with the pathology evaluation of some of these studies I told you about. Um, Drs. Tulaney, D. Michelle, and Wolf, um, who've helped me a lot through ECOG, um, and a cooperative group in terms of getting optimized PCR off the ground. Our colleagues at uh, JScreen, who I love working with and have so enjoyed this process of getting cancer gen off the ground, um, and then many of our colleagues at iSpy. And then most importantly, all the patients who continue to contribute to research and help move the field forward. Um, with that, I'll stop. I'm happy to take questions uh, either live or from the chat. Thank you. A great talk, uh, Dr. Loss. I think you had a question. Yeah, I don't know that we know that information yet because these studies are still getting off the ground, but that will be one of the endpoints we look at you know, how many people recur and where do they recur. Um, and so I think that information will be forthcoming as we look at those patients who do recur despite the pembrolizumab. I think yeah. there's a question in the back. Um, for short, uh, are you 
Uh, yeah. Uh, with regards to the team, so I think I think it's a little bit more established, you know, what what to do with uh, driving vision and red cancer. What do you counsel the patients for the other cancers and the other genes that you find out to be similarly two of the genes? Yeah, so I mean, it depends, you know, which gene, obviously, and what the patient situation is. You know, there are other genes now, like PALB2, where we actually do now know a fair amount about what to do with in terms of breast cancer risk. Um, and we know more and more now with the BRCA genes about, you know, what to do with ovarian cancer risk, pancreatic cancer risk, and those kinds of things. Um, you know, one of the things that patients do get information about, of course, is that there are the po there is a possibility of getting diagnosed with a variant of unknown significance or something where we know less. Um, but that is something that the genetic counselors have been actively working on. And I asked recently because we were going through, you know, kind of what the data was and what we were seeing in terms of results from these patients who are screened. Um, and there have actually been fewer and fewer variants of unknown significance, which is a, a lovely thing. Um, but you're right. I think that's one of the challenges of genetic testing these days is we have the capability to do so many things. Um, but when you test for 73 genes as opposed to two, you do sometimes open cans of worms that you might not want. Um, the good thing is, I think that you we're often seeing fewer mutations in those things where we don't know as much what to do with um, because those genes, there are fewer mutations in those genes that we know to test for. Um, so we are getting more actionable information than not. But very good question. Is this, is this screening for in for in a BRCA mutation carrier, you mean? Yeah. Um, so, you know, if you've got a mutation in BRCA1 or BRCA2, the ovarian cancer risk by age 70 actually is quite high. Um, those patients, you know, mostly what we recommend is that they actually have their ovaries and tubes removed um, by age 40, ideally, if you're BRCA1, and by 50, if you're BRCA2, um, just because the risk of getting ovarian cancer at a young age is higher in a BRCA1 mutation carrier. Um, screening is tricky because they do transvaginal ultrasound and CA125, but those are not actually shown to improve survival in patients with ovarian cancer. I think, you know, sometimes the gynecologist will do that and patients want it because it gives them some peace of mind. Um, but typically what we encourage actually is just having that surgery. Um, and then with pancreatic cancer, it's tricky because, you know, it's again, a lethal disease, but a hard one to screen for. Um, here at Emory, I often actually send them to Field Willingham and his colleagues over in uh, GI and they will, in patients who have a family history of pancreatic cancer and a BRCA1 or 2 mutation, um, they will alternate MRI with ERCP every other year. Um, there is data to support doing that. Um, but again, it's tough. I mean, I think it's knowledge is power, as I said. Like, it's good to know what your risk is so that you can act on it, uh, but it can also be very stressful. Yeah, well, so there is work. Let's just, we'll just repeat the question just to make sure that yeah. those are like. So the question is like just the long term follow up on patients who we screen for, for genetic uh, variants. Yes, yeah, so those patients are being followed. You know, again, it's 14% test positive for something. At least that's what we've seen over the past three years. Um, there will be publications coming out looking at, you know, that experience, um, what mutations are testing positive for. I think, you know, one of the things we don't have as clear follow-up on, because patients are not required to report to us, like, what they do with, you know, this information um, is, you know, do they have prophylactic surgeries? Um, do they get cancer diagnoses? But you're right, actually would be a good thing. Like, because the thing is now it's, it's a, you know, kind of like the J-screen reproductive carrier testing. Now that it's sort of an option, people can log on. Um, if they want to go through their insurance, it's 200 bucks. If they don't, it's 350 but they pay the money, they give the saliva sample, and it's their genetic information. So they're not required to give us that information. Um, but we do have the information for what the mutations were. Um, I agree with you, though. It would actually be very interesting to see if there could be more planned follow-up on that or in cohorts like this. It's actually a great question. In the Emory... Oh, do you want to repeat it? Do you repeat it? Oh, you go ahead. Okay. Um, <laughs> just the question of whether uh, in looking at some of the immune-based biomarkers, we're looking at adverse events and how the immune profile might relate to adverse event uh, experience in patients receiving immunotherapy. Is that the question? Yeah. So I think that'd be a great question to ask and answer. It's not one that we looked at when we did, when Dr. Wood did her study, um, but it's one that we actually probably could pretty easily look at in a follow-up uh, study to those patients because, you know, while we don't have, it, it was not a prospective study, it was retrospective. So in that particular cohort, all we would have would be the charts to go on. 
Um, but because all those patients were treated here, that actually could be a fascinating follow-up um, and, and one worth doing. I will say also, there's some discussions within the group of looking, doing some work with Anat Metabuti and looking at you know, AI, looking at associations with outcome as well as developing toxicity. Any other, I, I have some questions online. So maybe we have time for one or two questions. Actually, I have a question just in terms of the genetics also. Yeah. So with the recent ASCO guidelines that just came out about <clears throat> when to do genetic testing that women who are less than age 65, we should be doing, who have early stage breast cancer, we should be doing uh, testing. And then over 65, is, mm -hmm. you know, depending upon the patient situation. So with yeah. this increased testing that we're doing, mm -hmm. Are there efforts, including efforts similar to J-Screen, mm -hmm. just to do more point of care testing, to, you know, just given how busy our genetic counselors are getting? Well, I think there are a lot of efforts to do that and to, you know, in, empower providers like us to order those tests and feel comfortable discussing the testing process and the results. Because one of the main challenges here, but also elsewhere, has been, you know, getting people to actually take that extra step of going to the other provider, the genetic counselor, to have the counseling to take the test. I think one of the challenges is that there are some patients for whom probably more testing than just BRCA1 and BRCA2 is appropriate. And it's sometimes better to do that through a larger panel or in consultation with a genetic counselor. Um, but you actually do, I think, fix a lot of the problem by doing more point of care testing, like you said. And I think the problem of not having enough genetic counselors for all these patients is a huge one and is one that's going to continue to be present, especially if we really do start to test every woman under the age of 65. Um, I think there's still questions about, you know, I, I still encounter patients in my clinic who maybe don't have a strong family history and maybe they're in their late 50s, early 60s, who don't feel like they want that information. I do think it's reasonable for patients to refuse, um, but I do think it's something that more and more clinics like ours are going to have to be offering um, in, with an easier mechanism. Yeah. Um, and so I think it'll be interesting to see with the, you know, especially in the breast cancer population, if that is something that gets rolled out here and elsewhere where patients are actually able to do more of that in the clinic, maybe even at a lower cost, programs like this may become less important, but um, certainly still of interest. So I'm going to just... Uh... Uh, address one question that's online that was from uh, Dr. Waller. Great talk. Given the impressive durable P PFS rates for low stage triple negative breast cancer, patients who receive surgery without adjuvant chemotherapy, compared to what we see in with late relapses among hormone receptor positive breast cancer, is the innate rate of metastasis in triple negative disease lower than in other breast cancer cells? That's a tricky one to answer. I mean, I think that, you know, these database studies, like the SEER database that I presented, it's hard to know exactly. I think the challenge with triple negative breast cancer is that unlike ER positive breast cancers, it tends to grow so quickly um, that often by the time you start treatment, it is possible that there are these little cells that have gotten out into the microenvironment and are well positioned to set up shop and grow later. And that's why we see such high metastasis rates uh, early on. I think that question of late recurrence in ER positive is a whole other really interesting topic that, you know, probably is, you know, outside of the scope of today, uh, but maybe a little bit different than what we see in triple negative. I think, you know, often what we tell our patients, especially those early stage ones, um, is that their outcomes probably are likely to be quite good. And those who get to PCR, as we've seen, their outcomes are likely to be quite good. And if they don't recur by three years or five years, they can walk away feeling pretty confident that they're going to do well and that they beat this. Um, with ER positive disease, we do see those recurrences even up to 20 years out. So even though the disease is less aggressive, um, it's harder to really feel like you've walked away confidently for quite some time. Yeah. I mean, even with your data mm -hmm. about just, you know, triple negative breast cancer is not all the same. Right. right. There are different subtypes. Yeah. No, for sure. Well, great, great talk. Thank you guys for uh, attending online and coming in person. And mm -hmm. I think I should be saying one other thing. Uh, give me one second. Do you have any other questions? <laughs> All right. Uh, we'll be uh, convening next week for Grand Round. Um, I'm sorry. Let me see if there's anything else that we needed to mention. Does anybody have any other questions while we're concluding? <clears throat> Thank you all for braving the cold and get out here. Yeah. Already sequencing data on the FFPE samples of patients getting neoadjuvant ACT. With the macrophage score, do you have a proposed mechanism of how that impacts survival? It's interesting. interesting. I'm, I'm not, not, I'm I'm not, not 100% sure. sure. I, I think, think it's interesting, interesting to see that it's something, something that we sort of found in our very small numbers of 25 patients. And we wonder, like, is this just a you know, coincidence? That's why we had to do those validation studies. It does seem like it persists. 
Um, um, it must have something to do, I would think, with sort of the immune phenotype and how these cancers respond or don't respond to chemo. And I wonder, because it is like you know, fundamentally an immune property, um, would those patients potentially respond better? And would that signature not lead to poor outcomes if they were to receive immunotherapy? Right. So the next step might be potentially to study that and look at that in patients who got the phenotype, two regimen or something else like it. Yeah. All right. What right. Uh, just wanted to mention next week we have Dr. John Su from Cleveland Clinic presenting on contemporary management of brain metastasis. To view all upcoming Winship Grand Rounds lectures, please visit the Grand Rounds page on the Winship Cancer Center website uh, or the Winship calendar. Thanks again for attending. Thank you. Thank you. Do you need to do anything? Yeah.